We've had a lot of activity in our small group this year, very little bit being spiritual. And so we're going to try to remedy that tonight by providing more time in prayer. In order to keep everything on task, we've compiled lists of prayer requests, and we're going to provide for long extended times of silent meditation, the key word being silent. And we're going to incorporate fasting so we won't be serving refreshments. Which will actually turn out to be a fairly normal evening since nobody eats the refreshments anyway. <laughs> uh, let's pray. Well, tonight, Jan and I thought that as a small group, we could spend the evening in prayer together. Yes, we thought by sharing prayer requests, it would just help us to get to know each other better. That is an excellent idea. This is turning out to be a perfect night. When I'm bored with my phone, I can just sleep. Well, let's begin with any requests. Do any of you have anything that we can add in to pray for? Well, I've just started a new job and the learning curve is kind of difficult. So if we could be praying for that. Very good. We will pray for that together as a group. Anything else we can add in? Well, we are pretty nervous about becoming parents. Mm -hmm. So if you could pray for the arrival of our baby. You know, we could do that right now. We just all lay hands on our belly. No, uh, why don't we pray from a safe distance on that one? You know, Tim, it's not just what you pray, but it's how you pray it. So I thought, you know, now would be a great time for us to introduce prayer postures. We'll start with you if you could just put your hands in the air. Now wave them like you just don't care. That's great, Tim. Now we'll try to get some good reception here. Let's see. A little twisty tie. There we are. That's great. And if you two could uh, get down on your knees and pray, that would be great. Fantastic. There we go. Perfect. And Jan, if you could just put your head into the carpet. Just put your head as deep into that carpet as you can. You know what? This is great. I have always wanted to be like lifted up in prayer. Mm. Can we can we do that? Oh, we sure can. Oh, awesome. Great. Fantastic. Just get down here. and Yeah, that's great. Yep. Yep. I'll grab the torso. If you fellas can grab his hands, that would be great. And Sandy, I need your help here lifting. I can't lift so, anything. I'm pregnant. Uh, just lift with your back. That's what I've always been told. If you're pregnant, lift with your back. Okay, on three. One, two. Well, nothing like a prayer meeting that never actually gets around to praying. Not exactly what we expected. Oh, that's good. The small group videos are great, but I have decided I don't know if it's more fun watching the small group video or watching your faces as you react to the small group video. Such an interesting group of characters and such a complicated topic, prayer. Let's throw that slide back up there, that last slide, and kind of let's look at this. La <laughs> it's kind of hard to recover from this. You know, when, when we put this video together on prayer, you know, we have, we, there's not a, we, we're not intending to be inappropriate, but there's kind of an idea around prayer that, you know, you, you, there's kind of issues that surround prayer. And this last picture kind of helps us understand some of the issues that surround prayer. The, the characters help us understand. If you look at Tim, he's, he's, he's exasperated. Ben's completely asleep. Tammy, she seems to be focusing. Sandy, she's clearly pious. Uh, Jan is quite cynical, which is completely understandable because she's looking at Sherman and Randy and trying to figure out what's going on there. <laughs> this, is, this is kind of the issues that we have with, with the, kind of the feelings that we feel with prayer. And, and we didn't even mention things like voice modification in prayer and using words in prayer that you never typically use. Have you ever noticed how some people pray and when they pray their voice goes down two octaves? <laughs> or how about people that in their prayers use the words thou and thine and thy? Nobody does that in real life. At least I don't think so. I don't know anybody that does that. But I got to admit, I've been guilty. I have prayed before, and my, I've done the, Dear Lord, I would thy bless my family, and thou givest us blessing and protection. I mean, there's this tendency, because prayer, you know, prayer's difficult. It can just, it, sometimes it's just hard. And sometimes it even seems complicated. But even though prayer is difficult, sometimes complicated, time-consuming, sometimes overwhelming. Prayer is to be an important and essential part of who we are 
as Christians. Please take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is found on page 920 in the Bible that your church provides. I'd encourage you to follow along in the Bible this morning. It will be helpful to understanding what God has to say to us. This morning, we are back in our study of the book of Romans, and we're back in our mini-series on the Ten Commandments of Love. We have said that these Ten Commandments of Love speak into our relationships, the relationships that we have with other people, with people in our family, with our friends, with our co-workers, with the fellow students, the people that we go to school with, with the people that we go to church with, these Ten Commandments of Love speak into and help us live in those relationships. We've also pointed out that these Ten Commandments of Love aren't specifically about our relationship with God, although they do help us to understand our relationship with God. Up until this point, to date, we've gone through five of the Ten Commandments of Love. We've looked at be sincere, be devoted, be zealous, be joyful in hope, be patient in affliction. Now we come to number six, the sixth commandment of love. It's found in Romans 12, verse 12. Specifically, it's the last phrase of verse 12. Be faithful in prayer. This is the sixth commandment of love. Be faithful in prayer. Just four words. But these four words are packed with meaning. Not to mention, they can raise more guilt than almost any other subject in the Bible. How many of us, how many of us can truly say that we are faithful in prayer? This past week, I've, I, I did, in my study, I came across different people who were faithful in prayer. One of the individuals I came across was Martin Luther. Martin Luther is a 16th century theologian who is primarily, he's the person primarily responsible for the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther is reported to have said, I am so busy that I have to spend four hours of prayer every morning. Four hours of prayer every morning. Now that may motivate you. But for me, it tends to demotivate me. It tends to make me feel kind of inadequate and guilty. This morning, as we look at what it means to be faithful in prayer, it is not my intention to guilt you into praying. I think guilt is not the best motivator. Guilt doesn't typically work that long. Typically, guilt does not provide motivation that will help us be faithful in prayer. My hope this morning, my intention this morning, is that you will be motivated, that we will be motivated together by God's grace and God's love and the purpose he has for you and the purpose that he has for us as a church. So first, let's talk about what it means to be faithful in prayer. Your translation may say constant in prayer or devoted to prayer. The Greek word here that is translated faithful in the NIV means to persist in, to be constant, to be devoted to something. As followers of Jesus, the instruction to us, the command to us is to be faithful in prayer. But before we move on, I want to make sure that we have a general, a basic understanding of what prayer is. Prayer is communicating with God. Prayer is talking to God. So when Paul instructs us to be faithful in prayer, what he's saying is, be faithful in communicating with God. Be faithful in talking to God. Now this doesn't mean that you pray every minute of every day, but it does mean that you persist in prayer. 
It does mean that you stick to the prayer, that you are devoted to prayer, that you have a pattern of devotion towards prayer. It's the idea of prayer being habitual for you. It's the opposite of random, occasional, or intermittent. It has with it the idea of having an intentional, regular, recurring rhythm and discipline of prayer being devoted to a pattern of prayer. This means in your life, you will set aside, you will spend time, disciplined time in prayer. Just like you spend time eating, just like you spend time sleeping, just like you spend time in the assignments that you are given at work or at school. Now this will look different for all of us, but it will be a significant thing that we're engaged in being devoted to a pattern of prayer. And being faithful in prayer is clearly different than not being faithful in prayer. I think we can agree that there's some types of prayer that are not examples of being faithful in prayer. If you pray only when a crisis enters your life, it's probably not being devoted to a pattern of prayer. If you pray only before meals, that may be a pattern of prayer, but I'm not sure that's exactly what Paul's getting at when he's instructing us to be faithful in prayer. If you do a now I lay me down to sleep every night, probably not a pattern devoted to prayer. If you pray, oh Lord, help me, as you enter the parking lot, hoping for a parking spot, <laughs> Probably not a, a devotion patterned faithful prayer. Now look at all of those things are good. They're legit prayers. Those are good prayers. But it's not what Paul has in mind when he says be faithful to pray. Because being faithful to prayer means prayer permeates your life. It is you praying about anything and everything that there is to pray about. Habitual, regular, recurring rhythm or discipline in your life. And I don't think it's ever something that we're going to be able to check the box and say, hey, I got this one all under control. But this morning, the intention is that we are moving towards being more faithful in prayer. Now we have a better understanding of what it means to be faithful in prayer. How is it that being faithful in prayer connects to these 10 commandments of love? What's the connection that's happening here? Why is be faithful in prayer one of the 10 commandments of love? When we look at these 10 commandments, it's easy for me to see how being devoted, being sincere, being zealous, being joyful in hope, being patient in affliction, it's easy to see how those connect to loving one another. It's easy to see how those are Ten Commandments of love. How is being faithful in prayer connected to the Ten Commandments of love? Another way to ask this is, why does love demand that we are faithful in prayer? Why does love demand that we are faithful in prayer? Because Paul clearly says on the list here, be faithful in prayer. There are two reasons that love demands that we are faithful in prayer. The first reason, love comes out of our relationship with God. Love comes out of our relationship with God, and we will only love to the degree that we have experienced love. And perfect love comes from God. God is love. And we can only experience God's love when we know him and when we are in relationship with him. And relationship requires communication. So when we look at the instruction to be faithful in prayer, 
We want to see specifically how God connects this for us in knowing him and how this connects to our love for him and from him. So take your Bibles, turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, page 947. Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to start reading in verse 15. And Paul is getting into a prayer here. This is Paul praying a prayer. It is Paul talking to God, beginning in verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Paul here is praying for these Christians in Ephesus, and he's praying for us. He says, he writes, I heard about your faith, and I'm praying for you. This applies to us. This is part of what we should pray. What Paul is doing here is he's praying for the Ephesians, he's praying for us, and he's giving us an example as well in how we're to pray. First, give thanks, and then ask for what we need. But what is it? What is it that we need? What is it that Paul asks for? His main request is found in verse 17. And this is for all Christians. Verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that, see that? Mm -hmm. So that you may know him better. The deepest need of every person is to know God. Did you hear me? The deepest need of every person is to know God. Not just know about God, but know God as your personal creator, your personal savior, your personal Lord, your personal friend. So Paul's main request here, that God may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Do you know God? Do you really know God? Or maybe better said, are you growing in your knowledge of God? Are you growing in knowing God more and more? This happens, Paul shows us, by praying for it. This happens by communicating with God, by talking with him. And this is not a one-time prayer. It's not just a one-time thing that Paul does. Look what he writes. It's continual. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that you might know God. This is for all Christians. Be faithful in prayer. Pray this for yourself faithfully. The more you talk with God, the better you will know him. And the more you know him, the better you know God, the more you will experience his grace and his love in your life. You see, talking with God, communicating with God, allows you to bask in God's love. It allows you to experience God in all he has for you. It allows you to know him and to know his love. Now, people ask me, people say, does prayer work? Does prayer work? And you know, it's a legitimate question. Does prayer really work? Is it worth my time to spend time talking with God? Is it worth the effort? What's the payback? Does prayer work? Let me ask you a question. Does it pay to talk to your wife? Now look at (laughs) I know that many of you in this room aren't married, but you know what I'm talking about. So roll with me here, okay? Does it pay to talk with your wife? Yes. Yes. Immediately the answer is, of course. If I don't talk with my wife, this marriage thing isn't going to go so well. But here's the follow-up question. 
Do you talk with your wife because it pays? Or do you talk with your wife because you love her? You see, when we come to God, we often come to God and we pray and we talk with God thinking about all the things that we're offering. We're offering him to be able to solve on our behalf. We're looking for the answers to the prayers that we're giving to God. More specifically, we're looking for the answers that we like that we receive from God. But when we go and we look for what we can get out of our relationship with our wife or what we can get out of our relationship with God, doesn't that hurt the relationship? Doesn't that wreck the relationship ultimately? You see, when we come to God, we're coming to God to talk with him. We're coming to God to communicate with him so that we can know him better. Every relationship requires communication. If you want to know your wife better, you better talk with her. If you want to know your husband better, you better talk with him. If you want to know your friend better, you better talk with them. Because in talking with them, you get to know them better and you get to share love together. Because every relationship requires communication. The more time you spend with God, the better you will know him. And the more you will experience his love. So yes, the answer to the question is yes, Prayer works because prayer always helps you get to know God better and to better experience his love. And it also gives us a better perspective on the relationships that we have with each other. It helps us love each other. So why does love demand that we pray for each other? Number one, so that we know God better and can experience his love. Second, love demands that we are faithful in prayer because once you experience God's love, you want to, you need to share that love with each other. So when God puts relationships in your life, your friends, your family, your co-workers, fellow students, people here at church, whatever the relationship that God brings into your life, you need to be, I need to be faithful in prayer because my faithfulness in prayer demonstrates my love for others. You see, the first and the best thing that you can do for anybody to tell them or to show them your love is to pray for them. Love, first and foremost, turns to prayer. It is the best thing you can do for anyone. Let me illustrate. Turn back to Luke chapter 11. Turn to Luke chapter 11. Stick with me here. Luke chapter 11. It's on page 844. Beginning in verse 5, Jesus tells a parable. Jesus is telling a story that's meant to make a point. That's what a parable is. And in this parable, this parable helps us see prayer as a demonstration of love. Beginning in verse 5. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one who inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are, and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Now to better understand what's going on here, because it's a little bit confusing what's happening here, to better understand what's going on here, imagine that Jesus is telling this parable directly to you. He is speaking directly to you. And he says to you, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight. Now you're going to go to your friend at midnight and ask him for three loaves of bread because you have another friend 
who needs some bread. You're knocking on the friend's door. This is the friend who has bread. You're knocking on his door, but that friend who has bread, he needs more prompting. So you keep knocking. You keep bugging your friend because he has bread and you have another friend who needs some bread. In fact, in the story, Jesus says that you have shameless audacity. Your friend with the bread even tries to get rid of you. No luck because you audaciously continue to ask. So eventually, the bread is provided. This is a story. This is a story about prayer. It speaks to someone's need. It speaks to our inability to meet that need. And it speaks to our link to the one who can meet the need. Listen, the story is about prayer. It speaks to someone who has a need, our inability to meet that need, and our link to someone who can meet that need. Think about the need. The friend to you, the friend who comes to you, has no food. That friend is hungry. You recognize your friend's need and you're compelled to act. You cannot ignore his need. You can't, look, you can't even wait till morning. You go in the middle of the night because of your friend's need. Because of your love for your friend, you have to act right away. But interestingly, in this story, you don't have any bread to meet the need. Bread. In the most obvious way that you would think you would be able to meet this need, by just providing bread to your friend, you don't have any bread. So you can't meet the need. Now this would come for some. Some would ignore the problem. Some would turn their friend away. I don't have any bread. There's nothing I can do for you. But not you. Not you, because you recognize your friend has a need. You know you can't meet the need, but you have a link to the person who can meet the need. You know the person who can meet the need, so you gave to your friend what you had. You gave to your friend the relationship you have with the person who can meet the need. This is the best solution of all. You can knock on the door of the person who has the bread and say, my other friend, he needs some bread. I know you have it. I know you can give him the bread. In this room this morning, there are many people with great needs. There are many people who need bread. You may be here this morning and you may need bread. You may be sick. Maybe you have cancer. Maybe it's heart disease. Maybe Parkinson's. Maybe you are in a relationship or you used to be in a relationship, but now that relationship is so broken, you don't see any hope for the restoration of that relationship. Maybe you're here and you have a financial issue that, that, that seems overwhelming. There is no way you are going to be able to meet that bill or that obligation next month. Or maybe you have an assignment at school or at work that is way beyond you. I will never be able to accomplish that assigned task. You are here this morning and you need bread. And we look around and we see all of these people and we think about all of the needs that are potentially represented in this room and we think to ourselves, what in the world are we ever going to be able to do because there seems to be such great problems and such great need. What is it that we're going to do? Well, we could, we could ignore. We could ignore the problems. We could ignore the needs. We could turn people away. But we can't do that because we love each other because we care for each other. So what do we do when we recognize that there's a need and we know we can't meet the need? Where is it that we go? We go to the person who has bread. Mm -hmm. And he has more than three loaves of bread. Amen. Who's the person that has the bread? 
God has the bread. God has an unlimited supply of bread. No matter what your need here is this morning, God has the bread to meet that need. There is no issue, concern, need that you face that he cannot provide for that need because he has an unlimited supply of bread. Have you ever had somebody come up to you and say they're praying for you? Has anybody ever come up to you and said, you know what, I know what you're going through. I'm praying for you. How does it make you feel? How does it make you feel when you know that someone is praying for you? How does it make you feel when somebody pulls you aside and prays for you? I'll tell you how it makes you feel. It makes you feel loved because being faithful in prayer is an act of love. You are demonstrating love for the person that you are praying for. How about the grandma who wakes up early every morning for 10 years to pray for her granddaughter to come back to Jesus? How about the person who knows of your prayer request who comes back to you two months late, two months later and she says to you, how is that going? That's love. Being faithful in prayer is an act of love. Because you have a relationship. You know the person who has the bread. And you are going to go on behalf of your friend and ask for the bread. Being faithful in prayer is an act of love because you are asking for bread on behalf of your friend. Before we close... I want to look at the bread. In Luke 11, Jesus tells the story and the provision is bread. I want to ask you, what is it that we're praying for? What is the bread? Well, when you ask for bread, you're asking God to meet their need. And when we read this parable in Luke 11, we automatically think about people's physical needs. A person is hungry, that means they need food. A person is sick, that means they need physical healing. A person is in financial distress, that means they need money. All of these provisions are bread. But don't, don't miss the most important bread of all. You see, it is natural for us to look at this story, to look at this parable, and think about the physical needs that we have, and to think that bread is a physical provision for physical needs. But Jesus is saying much, much, much more in this parable. We agreed... We agree that the person providing the bread in the parable is God. And at first glance, the bread is the bread. And it meets someone's physical need. But what if the bread is more than just bread? What is the bread? I heard it. Who is the bread? Jesus is the bread. In John 6, Jesus in his own words says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never be hungry. When we go to God and communicate with God and talk with God, when we are faithful in prayer on behalf of other people, 
We are demonstrating our love for them. This is an act of love. And we pray for God to provide them bread. We pray for God to provide for their physical needs. But the problem is, is we first always look at the physical needs. Our tendency is to look at the temporal as being the most important. And the temporal is not what is most important. What is most important is that God would provide Jesus the bread of life to meet the needs, to meet all of our needs. And this isn't just about salvation. This isn't just about somebody receiving Jesus for the first time. This is any time you are lonely, any time you feel empty, any time you're depressed or full of anxiety or you have cancer or you have heart disease, maybe you are on your deathbed. This is any time you have a need, the most important bread that you will ever receive is Jesus. It is the eternal. So no matter what, yes, no matter what you are going through, no matter what you are going through, if you have Jesus, the cancer is not as big a deal. If you have Jesus, the financial issue is not as big a deal. If you have Jesus, you will not be alone. If you have Jesus, he will help you with the depression and with the anxiety, but you have to recognize that Jesus is the bread. So you need to pray for God to give you the bread of life, and you need to pray for your friends because you love them. You need to ask God to give them Jesus because he is the bread of life, and they will never, ever go hungry if they have Jesus. The, elder, the elders of Calvary Church, every first Tuesday of the month, the elders of Calvary Church pray for people. And they bring people in and they pray for them every first Tuesday of the month. And it's amazing. The elders gather people together and they pray for these individuals because they love them. And they follow the instructions of James 5. And in James 5, James says that you, the elders, go before the elders for praying. And, 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 and the elders will pray for your healing. And every time the elders say this, the elders say, we are here to pray for your healing. And we are going to pray for your physical healing. But we are going to pray for your emotional healing as well. We are going to pray for your mental healing, and we are going to pray for your spiritual healing. We are going to pray that God would heal you in every possible way that he can heal you. And there have been people who have been healed physically. There have been people who have been provided physical bread for a physical healing. But I have seen the notes. I have seen the notes of gratitude, the notes of thanks that have come from people, some of whom who have been healed physically, others of whom have not yet been healed physically, but there is a link in these notes. There is a recognition of whether they were healed physically or whether they have not yet been healed physically, that they had an experience with Jesus, because that is the real miracle. That is the real thing of miraculous, it's the miraculous nature of God. That when you pray for somebody as an act of love, you are praying for bread so that they may experience that bread ultimately, and most importantly, to know Jesus. Because Jesus is God's love for you. It happened to me this morning. So it's 7 o'clock in the morning. I get here at 7 o'clock. I'm sitting in my office, and I got the pregame jitters. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make it. I'm all messed up, thinking, oh, boy, I got two of these to do. 7.15, knock, knock, knock. Door opens. Ardo Draper comes in my office. Ardo's on staff here. He's a friend of mine. He comes in my office. Hey, Tom, what's up? Not much, Ardo. What's up with you, man? Good to see you. Good to see you. Can I pray for you? <laughs> what did I feel? What did I recognize from Ardo? Ardo has a relate. He knows God. Ardo has experienced God's love. 
And Ardo came to me to share God's love with me by being faithful in prayer. It was Ardo's act of love towards me, and it was Ardo's act of love towards you. Yes! It is all of us who are in this together. Paul says, be faithful in prayer. God is going to bring people into your lives. Family, friends, co-workers, fellow students, people here at the church. And he's going to say, these people I have placed in your life so that you can love them. Be faithful in prayer so that you may know God and experience his love for yourself. And be faithful in prayer so that you can demonstrate your love for others by praying for them. Look at the last few verses in Luke chapter 11. Actually, beginning in verse 9. This is Jesus' promise. Listen to these words. They immediately follow the parable. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father in heaven give, who? The Holy Spirit to those who ask him. It's January 8, 2017. In 2017, how are you going to demonstrate love to others? Be faithful in 